Yo, what's going on YouTube and welcome back to Goal Line Hockey. It's your boy, Kevin Forte. And um, I don't know where to start with today's video. So, get up this morning. It's been a pretty quiet off-season for the New York Islanders up, up until this morning. The New York Islanders have fired or, you know, dismissed head coach Barry Trotz. No longer a part of... Of the New York Islanders. I'm speechless guys. I, I really. I really want to believe. That Lou Lamorello. Knows what he's doing here. But this one. This is a head scratcher. And this is one that. The Islanders fan base. You've been trying to grow the fan base back. Get everybody on your side. This one. If this is going to be a tough PR sell for Lou Lamorello and it didn't really help his case in what he said so let's get into what Lamorello said this morning these are all in quote from Lou Lamorello that's where we're going to start today so from Lou Lamorello the general manager and the president of hockey operations of the New York Islanders I believe that this group of players needs a new voice and we'll get to all this we'll all kind of put this together at the end this decision wasn't just primarily made on just this season. Although, would rather not get into any of the reasons. So he's kind of saying he doesn't want to get into the specifics of why he let Barry Trotz go, which I think is just is not really the best way to handle it. Um, this is a business decision as far as hockey and winning. And the last quote... Obviously, he's saying, I'd like to thank Barry for everything he's done for the organization over the past four years. Unfortunately, it was my role to make the best decision for the organization and for the team. So that's where we're starting off today, guys. Um, I'm stunned, really. Like, I really don't know any other way to put this. Barry Trotz, who's been the head coach of the New York Islanders for the past four seasons, um, really changed the the trajectory of this franchise uh, ever since he came in his first season. Uh, they made it back to the playoffs for the first time in what had been two seasons before that. The Islanders made the playoffs in three of the four years under Barry Trotz. Obviously, this this past season being the only season he missed the playoffs. The first season, they got to the second round. They beat Pittsburgh in the first round of the playoffs. They obviously got swept in the second round by the Carolina Hurricanes in 2019. You go to 2020 in the COVID playoff bubble. They went to the Eastern Conference Finals and went to seven games against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And they did the exact same thing in 2021. And you can make an argument for the past two seasons, had we not seen the Tampa Bay Lightning dynamo that has been the Tampa Bay Lightning, the Islanders may have had at least one, potentially two, Stanley Cups over the past two seasons. As crazy as that sounds, that was on the table for the Islanders. And one missed playoff season after that where they had a 13-game road trip to start the season. COVID issues. Had they had gotten that whole COVID you know, situation and the spreading of throughout the locker room a month later, the Islanders would not have been playing those games in the beginning of the UBS, right? They played some really impact games. They played, I think, the Devils twice and they lost. They played the Rangers. They obviously lost the, you know, the, the inaugural opener against the Calgary Flames. Um, they went to the game I went to, my first game at UBS against San Jose. Obviously, they lost that game in a shootout. It was just a, it was, the Outers could not catch a break earlier this season. And considering they were bottom three in the NHL standings and came all the way back to potentially get into the playoffs, ninth in the Eastern Conference standings behind Washington, it, it, this is just crazy. Now, again, I am looking at this more as practicality, purely stats here. It doesn't truly make sense, but there's more underlying issues, and I think that is unfortunately what happened here. So, let's think of it this way, and this is a weird example, but another example. Jeff Blaschel in Detroit. 
He's been the head coach of that team for seven seasons. He was there before Steve Eisman got in. And Eisenman last offseason decided to keep Blashill. There was, you know, he was on the hot seat. There was a lot of questions last year. Would they keep Jeff Blashill or not? Okay, well, you know what? It's fair. Give him another year. Well, now we are a year later after Jeff Blashill has left Detroit and he gets fired anyway. And there was actually at the press conference they asked, you know, is there a little bit of regret? Obviously, Eisenman said no regret. We decided to keep him. But inevitably, they let go of Jeff Blasio a year later, even though they had, you know, they doubled down, they believed in Blasio, but they ultimately fired him anyway the next season. So the argument could be made that if the Islanders had let this next season go and they said, all right, we had a bad season, let's stick with Barry Trotz till next season. Well, there's also the underlying issue that they just signed him to a, this would, this is his contract year with the Islanders. So he would have had to renegotiate a contract. So the Islanders, let's say they signed him, you know, Barry Trotz would have wanted another three or four year contract with the Islanders. So let's say this season goes badly again for the Islanders. Again, hypothetically, right? Worst case scenario, the Islanders are where they were at this year, next year as well. Now you're looking at a spot now where the Islanders have missed the playoffs two straight seasons and they just signed Barry Trotz to an extension that hypothetically is going to have another two or three years on it. They fire Barry Trotz in the first year of his new contract and now you're kind of in a tough spot. And that's why I think the Islanders decided to let him go. Instead of giving him another year, which again, considering the amount of success he had with the Islanders, it's hard to argue that, I mean, this is a guy that second most wins in franchise history, only behind... The guy that's behind me right now, and that's Al Arbor. It's Al Arbor and Barry Trotz. That's it. And that's only, like, that is it. Like, the Islanders have not had any real good coaching since Al Arbor. I mean, I, you know, I hate to look back, but, I mean, in my time watching the Islanders, who has it been? It's been Peter Laviolette, who Millberry fired, and that was a big mistake because we've seen Laviolette be a pretty damn good head coach. Doug Waite, Jack Capuano. Um, I'm trying to remember who else was even in there. I think that was pretty much it. I, I mean, again, that just shows you how like insignificant the other guys were. Um, Jeff Gordon, who was behind the bench in Philly for a couple years and in Lehigh Valley. But I mean, those are the guys we're talking about. Like the Islanders have not had a guy like Barry Trotz since the great Al Arbor. So in that sense, it's a t- it, this is a tough blow for the Islanders. And when you look at the market of who else is available... It's really hard to to say like the honors are going to go after any of those guys. Now, the only guy that I'm still kind of waiting on, well, two guys. There's Bruce Boudreaux, who's having some contract disputes in Vancouver. So that's one that could still be on the table. And Pete DeBoer. Pete DeBoer in Vegas. If the Vegas Golden Knights decide to let go of Pete DeBoer, that's a guy that I could see Lou going after. Now, you guys may be saying, well, why is he going to go after Pete DeBoer? Pete DeBoer helped the New Jersey Devils. That's the guy Lou brought in in his tenure in New Jersey. And they ended up going to the, I think, the Eastern Conference Finals two years in a row. They went to the Stanley Cup Final where, you know, they got their back blown out by the LA Kings. But they had some success there with Pete DeBoer. I would not be surprised if Lou went that direction. Again, if it got to that point where DeBoer would even be fired. At this point, he is still with Vegas. So those are the two guys that are very outside chance guys. We've also been hearing some of the older class guys that are available. Mike Babcock, again, he has some history with him. He was with him. He brought him in in the Toronto Maple Leafs when Lou came to Toronto. So Babcock is available and he has some history with him. So that's another guy. John Tortorella, I think that's the craziest one out there. But listen, Nothing nothing would surprise me at this point. John Tortorella is a name that's been thrown out there. Again, a former Ranger head coach. Please don't do that to us, but that's going to be thrown out there. And then we start to get to the ones that I think are the most realistic at this point. And that's Jeff Blaschel, who I just talked about in Detroit. Jeff Blaschel is a guy I think the Islanders could target. A young up-and-coming head coach. That He was a good head coach in Detroit. But I think it's just he was he was there for, you know, what's that saying? You're there long enough where you become the villain or the enemy. And I think that's what happened to Blasio. He was there during the entire rebuild of this team. His teams looked good. You know, they looked like a good structured team 
up until things kind of fell apart at the end of this season, and that's probably why he got the boot. So Jeff Blaschel, and a guy that's already in the Islanders organization and was behind the bench with Barry Trotz, because we haven't heard any talk about the assistants or the goalie coaches leaving the Islanders, which that would be a huge blow. I think, you know, you look at Piero Greco, I'm trying to remember the other guy, uh, the goalie coaches, they've been really good for the Islanders. Mitch Korn, Mitch Korn and Piero Greco, those guys have to stay. Those are critical pieces uh, to the success of the Islanders goaltending, especially with, you know, Sorokin this season. Um, so those guys got to hopefully stay, but we haven't heard those guys leaving or being relieved of their duties. So there is reason to believe they'll stay. And specifically, Lane Lambert. Lane Lambert is, I think, the guy the Islanders are going to go with. Now, he doesn't have any head coaching experience at the NHL level. Uh, he interviewed for the Anaheim Ducks job last season. Uh, you know, they ended up sticking with um, with Dallas Aikens, but he was being interviewed. And we also heard about, um, you know, maybe Detroit having some interest this year, replacing Jeff Blaschel, maybe Lane Lambert going to Detroit. He may end up staying with the Islanders. Uh, Lane Lambert's been a big part of the Islanders. Um, really, I, I'm pretty sure he's their defensive guy. Um, or maybe their offensive guy. I hope not the power play because he's not been very good in that category. The Islanders' power play has sucked. So, I again... But that's something that the Islanders could go with. But again, we've seen so many of these you know, tryout head coaches before. Like I said, Doug Waite... Um, and at the time, Jack Capuano, and they didn't work. So for the Islanders to go that route, not getting a credible, legit guy behind the bench. Again, this is no discredit to Lane Lambert, but to say that going from Barry Trotz to Lane Lambert is is a good move here. I mean, you, that's laughable. And again, when you consider what Barry Trotz did with the Islanders, four seasons. Three playoff seasons of those four years. Two times they went to the Eastern Conference Final against Tampa, like I talked about. He won the Jack Adams back in 2019 for the head coach, you know, the best coach of the year. So that goes for something as well. And like I said, second most wins in NHL in New York Islanders franchise history. That's right, in four seasons, only behind the great Al Arbor. So, I mean, I, <sighs> speechless. That's the word I have. Now, here's to the point that why I think he got fired as well. So, there was some talk at the end of the season. Again, Islanders fans are forgetting this because of, you know, all, you know, we're just kind of drunk in the last three years of success for the Islanders still. I, I don't think this season has really registered for the team. This team kind of got complacent and I think that again and I know fans are gonna hate me for saying this because this is the I think most people are gonna go with the Islanders really fucked up and I agree with that because you look at who's available but there was some stuff with Barry Trotz this season that was questionable um especially when you look at some of the nights where Oliver Wallstrom was on the bench or in the press box as a healthy scratch. This was your freaking best goal scorer. Like I mean honestly Bar you know obviously Matt Barzell is your is the guy driving the offense, but Oliver Wallstrom can score goals. He started playing a very physical game at the end of the season and kind of showing that he can be a physical force and I think that really helped him. I mean, he was laying big hits, you know, unfortunately that big hit on Jack Hughes that injured him, but he was laying some big hits just throughout the season, you know, in the games that I saw him. So he looked pretty good, and he was kind of going with what Barry Trotz wanted him to do, right? You can't just score goals. You got to be a little physical. He did that little blend of both, but was still being pushed into the press box upstairs, right? So that was frustrating. There's always that talk about he wasn't playing some of the young guys enough, like Kiefer Bellows, right? He was never going to get a shot. You know, Kiefer Bellows was never going to get a real shot with Barry Trotz behind the bench. And maybe was there some of that talk between Lou and Barry at the end of the season? And they said, listen, our philosophy is they're just not going to work. And it was a little bit of not meeting in the middle. And now we have what happened. So as much as this is a firing or a dismissal on Barry Trotz, 
you have to think to some point, maybe there was a little bit of just a disagreement for what should happen next for the team. Now, here's where I get to. Is this Lou Lamarello saying, listen, we're not happy with the fact that you weren't playing the young guys like Sebastian Ajo enough. You were putting Andy Green out there too much, Zdeno Chara out there too much um, on defense. And then for forwards, were you putting in guys that shouldn't have been there? I mean, even I look at another example. Um, the Islanders game against the Rangers at UBS, because I had to witness that thumping of a game. Six to three Rangers, and that one hurt. And Semyon Varlamov got got destroyed. Um, and he should not have played that game. Sorokin has been the better goalie. Why did you not go with him? And that's a game where maybe Lou was saying, why is Varlamov playing and not, and not Sorokin? And that's maybe just some of the disagreements that they had during the season. And obviously, like I said up front, not seeing enough of guys like Bellos and Wallstrom for the liking. Again, considering the Islanders were out of the playoff picture, why were they not playing more? And why was Wallstrom and Bellos sitting in the press box? That's the kind of stuff that maybe Lou Lamorello just was like, I don't like what we're doing here. This is not going to allow us to get to where we need to be. You know, the last two seasons are the last two seasons. That's in the past now. And yes, that does account for something. But we're looking at right now, what have you done for me? The Islanders missed the playoffs. The Islanders were not good against playoff teams. You look at their record against playoff teams this season. Yeah, they, you know, they had the COVID stuff. Yes, they had all that, that stuff that didn't go their way. But they still mightily struggled this season to play well against the teams you have to beat. And when you consider the fact, I mean, let me pull up the stat. The Islanders were horrible against playoff teams. I want to see if I still have this. Uh, Let me see what I got here. Okay, so this is from Drive for Five, which is one of the Islanders. And this is during this season. The Islanders are 8, 23, and 2 this year against teams currently in postseason position. They are 25, 6, and 7 against teams not in a playoff spot. Many seem to think the Isles are a good hockey team, but just got unlucky this season with COVID-19 and obviously the road trips, the new arena, and injuries. However, this shows that the Islanders really struggled against good teams, something that can be said for most bad hockey teams. And what do you think about that stat? And that's from Drive for Five. And that was during the season. So that was something that we have to remember here. The Islanders mightily struggled against good hockey teams this season. So as much as they had the issues that they did in the beginning of the year, there are some troubling stats for the Islanders that they endured this season. And that's when you have to look as, you know, no attachment to Barry Trotz. Let's forget that Barry Trotz, the name Barry Trotz is not there. Let's just say blank head coach on NHL 22. Right, and again, that's not the situation, but we're going with it here, right? You got to go with me. The Islanders were not good, and let's look. I want to see their head-to-head stats this season. So, most notably, it's got to be in their division. So let's see how they did. So Washington, they struggled against in four games. Um, actually, they played well. They won those last two games at the end of the year. Um. So they beat Anaheim, they beat Arizona. Again, non-playoff teams, they played well against Boston. They played good. Here, let's let's put these into. So they were the only four teams in the National Hockey League they did not lose against this season. Anaheim, Arizona, Ottawa, and Winnipeg. All non-playoff teams. Um Columbus, they played well against. Montreal, they played well against. Chicago, New Jersey, Philly, Vegas. And the first playoff team that's on here is the Boston Bruins, who are 11th. Again, that's what I'm talking about here. Who did they struggle? Who did they not beat this season? Five teams that the Islanders did not beat this season. Toronto. Yes, I know. That was was rough. Toronto, Tampa, Minnesota, L.A., Colorado, Calgary. God damn it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six teams that they did not beat this season. You know what's interesting about those six teams that they didn't get a single win against this year? They all made the playoffs. They all 
made the playoffs. So that's what I'm talking about. That stat shows up right in your fucking face. That is the Islanders' reality here. And you look at the next teams that are above that. So we talked about those six teams that they didn't beat this year. They also played very poorly against the Florida Panthers, the Nashville Predators, the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Carolina Hurricanes. And the first non-playoff team is the Buffalo Sabres that they struggled against. And they went 1-2. You know, they had a 1-2-0 record against Buffalo this year. That's the first non-playoff team. So those first 10 teams all made the playoffs, and the Islanders could not beat those teams. So that's what I'm talking about, guys. The Islanders' stats, it shows right here, they struggled head-to-head -head against playoff teams. So as much as we all want to talk about how they kept things close, and yeah, they kicked the ass of the teams that sucked. Congratulations. You get a cookie for that. You beat teams that you were supposed to beat. But a playoff team, which the Islanders were not, they couldn't beat other playoff teams. And that's the reality of the situation for the Islanders. So now let's look at the Islanders. Let's zoom in on the microscope of their season here. So let's take a look. So for most of the way, yeah, I mean, let's take a look here. Ch -ch -ch. Okay, so power play and penalty kill. So the Islanders power play this season was over 22%, which is actually above the league average. Congratulations, the Islanders had a pretty good power play this season. That's nice to see. Their penalty kill, which they are known for as a very defensive-minded team that's very good defensively, 84%, which is 5% more than the league average, which the Islanders, obviously, they are top five in that category. No doubt about it. 84% power play is really, really good. So that's not surprising there. Their save percentage this season, the league average was a 900 save percentage. In a league where we know scoring was up this season, the Islanders had a 913 save percentage between Varlamov and Ilya Sorokin. And I think they're accounting Corey Schneider in, this, in there as well. Because he did start for the Islanders a couple of games. So a 913 save percentage. Again, that's almost a whole like that is incredible when you consider that. The Islanders had really so let's look at look at what the Islanders did. So they had good goaltending, they had a good power play, a good penalty kill, which we can't normally talk about the Islanders having good penalty, like special teams. They are not known for good special teams. That's not the case this year. They were even on the power play. According to the league average, the Islanders are in the upper echelon in terms of that category. So, I, I don't know. Now, here's where you could say there's some discrepancy for the Islanders. They don't score a ton of points. The Islanders' leading point producers, they were tied. Both Brock Nelson and Matt Barzell each had 59 points for the New York Islanders. That's well below most playoff teams who have at least a guy that's a point per game. You look at the Colorado Avalanche. They had multiple guys. Miko Rantanen. Um, if Gabe Landeskog didn't get hurt and Nathan McKinnon, they'd probably be in the 80, 80 to 100 point range, right? The Penguins, you have got Crosby. I think even Evan Rodriguez got pretty close to a point per game. Jake Gensel. Even the Rangers, Artemi Panarin, Mika Zibanejad, Chris Kreider. You're seeing a theme here. All these guys have, all these teams have point per game players. The Islanders, they're, they didn't even get six. They don't have a guy that has 60 points this year. And again, that's part of the system of the team. But you look at the plus minus, and this is kind of an ugly stat. The best plus minus is, of course, Adam Pellick, the, the almighty Adam Pellick. He was a plus 20 for the Islanders. And you look at this, you've got, okay, so ex excluding goaltenders, the Islanders had seven guys, only seven guys on the active roster that had a plus minus of a zero, zero or better. You have Ryan Pollock, Kyle Palmieri, Jen Gabriel Peugeot, they were each a plus minus zero, so they evened out. Michael Dow Cole, Austin Zarnick. Had a plus one and a plus five. Of all people, Zdeno Chara had a plus eight this season. And obviously Adam Pellick with a plus 20. That's it. Everybody else on the New York Islanders was a minus this season. So when you look at that, I mean, again, when you look at pure stats, no names next to the thing. You're just looking at player A, player B, player C, and going through. 
The Islanders struggled. And you look at, actually, this is kind of fitting. Who has the worst plus minus on the New York Islanders? Nobody's going to talk about this. Who had the worst plus minus on the Islanders? With a minus 15, Matt Barzell had the worst plus minus on the New York Islanders this season. Not Andy Green, not Zdeno Chara, not Noah Dobson. It was Matt Barzell. So these are the sort of things that you have to look at and you have to say to yourself, that was that was a struggle for the New York Islanders. The Islanders struggled there. And when you look at, you know, I mean, we could even look at time on ice here. I want to see this. So uh, what do we got here? So looking, obviously, defensemen lead the pack here. And it's the four defensemen you would expect. It's Dobson led the team in point, you know, in terms of on ice time. With over 21 minutes, same thing for Pulak and Pellick, um, Mayfield, and then Chara. Chara was playing over 18 minutes per night. That's slightly concerning. Barzell, again, he had the worst plus minus. He was also the, the forward with the most ice time at over 18 minutes of ice time. So you're seeing the theme here. The Islanders, their defensemen, those top four guys were heavily played. And then you're looking at Barzell as the next guy, which I'm not surprised. But then who had the least amount of ice time? Oliver Wallstrom with 12 minutes a night. That's probably not enough. And Kiefer Bellows, who was getting 11 minutes a night. So here's the thing. So Wallstrom and Bellows were getting around 11 to 12 minutes of ice time per night. Who had more ice time than them? Casey Sezikis, Cal Clutterbuck, Zach Parise, I mean, you could argue guys like Paul Mary and Lee and Beauvillier, but those guys all had more ice time than Bellos and Wallstrom. Mo notably Wallstrom, right? Because Wallstrom's the guy that should be in the top six. Why is Zizekas and Clutterbuck and Parise playing more than Oliver Wallstrom? Again, who is that on? That's Barry Trotz. So for all, as much as I love Barry Trotz, again, he's my guy. He's my G, right? But... He, he struggled this year with this team. This team did not reach the standards that they were supposed to. And as everybody's talking about the Islanders, how they had a great season, and this is a massive L for the Islanders, I'm going to sit here and say Barry Trotz is a main component for why this team struggled this year. Now, again, you can absolutely make the argument that the roster was not Good enough. And you can't blame Barry Trotz for not making the trades or making the signings necessary. That is true. You can't blame Barry Trotz for the lack of talent on this team. And we've talked at infinitum how they need a guy that can put the puck in the back of the net. And he might be sitting right here in the Islanders organization. And his name? Oliver Wallstrom. He might be the answer that the Islanders need that can score goals and be the guy that plays and can quite frankly, the only guy that could keep up with Matt Barzell on the top line. But he wasn't playing enough. And Lou Lamorello didn't get the guy that they needed, right? He didn't get the Panarin. He didn't get whoever it is, right? Whoever you want to throw out there. Matt Duchesne, which I think, looking back now, might have actually been a blessing they didn't get him. Um, I'm trying to think of the other guy that they didn't get. I mean, they looked at Landeskog, but that never really was going to materialize. So, I mean, again... The Islanders didn't get that pure sniper goal scorer, and that was evident on their roster. But again, with what with what Barry Trotz had and Oliver Wallstrom, you could argue alone that could be a huge culprit for why the team struggled. And maybe Lou Lamorello as Barry Trotz at the end of the season. Listen, I, I know you've got your thing. You know you want the young guys to work for their spot. But why didn't Wallstrom play more than Sezikis and Clutterbuck and Parise? And maybe Barry Trotz didn't have the answer that Lou wanted. And he said, okay, listen, that and the fact the team missed the playoffs and everything else, this is why we have to make this move. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. What do you think of this move for the Islanders? I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. Like, honestly, I'm speechless. I really, I don't know what to say. I mean, this is a crazy move for the Islanders, but they're, again, I'm kind of back in Lou here because I think there is stuff to be said that, again, you take off the foggy glass mirrors of the last three seasons prior to this year, the Islanders, they were not good enough. They were, this is a team that 
honestly, they deserve to finish where they finished. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. So let me know what you guys think. And who will be the next head coach of the Honors? Do you think it'll be Jeff Blashill? God forbid it's Mike Babcock or John Tortorella. Or do you think they stay in house with a guy like Lane Lambert? Let me know what you guys think. Guys, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you again next time.